Good afternoon, friends. Glad to see everyone joining. Thank you. We've got a, a nice, healthy group of um, folks joining us today for this super important conversation. I don't have to tell anyone on this webinar how support, how important supporting our staff is right now, how much we're hearing about difficulties with children self-regulating and uh, since COVID and with teachers struggling with that in the classroom. So with retention issues, hiring issues, that balance between what's happening in the classroom and supporting children, along with supporting our staff through managing behaviors and trying to give them um, the uh, support they need in, in order to help retention, um, help them and do our business better is just a really delicate balance right now. So I'm thrilled to have my good friend Sheila Lewis here um, who has so much to share. And Sheila, um, um, I'm going to introduce someone that I adore dearly and who um, I think that maybe I was trying to think today when we started working together. And I'm going to guess it was about 30 years ago, Sheila. Would that be right? 1998 or nine, maybe. Ooh, are you going to make me do math right now? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yes. So now, yeah, I know. Somewhere around there, we yeah. started working, to, maybe even earlier than that. Yeah, I think so. But um, yeah. Sheila is a person I respect tremendously in the work that she does. And I want to give her the opportunity to tell you guys a little bit more about herself and what she does because um, I want to honor it that way and it, it's special and I hope that you will as you grow your business consider resources like Sheila that help you support your teams better, help you hire better, retain better, support people better, which supports children better. But I am going to stop talking now and turn it over to Sheila and let her share with you and I'll see you in just a bit. Nice. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, I am Sheila Lewis, and I am the um, director of ADA compliance for the Sunshine House. And so on a regular basis, one of the, one of the things that I handle is um, the enrollment of children with special needs as far as being making sure that we can accommodate and those accommodations are in place. I also support uh, teachers and centers with um, behavior concerns that go above and beyond what developmentally appropriate practices can support as well in the classroom and do a lot of brainstorming and with, with teachers and directors. Um, I also do a lot of parent conferences because that's a huge component for us as because it, it takes everybody involved. And I know that you guys feel the stressors of um, the increase in uh, the behavior issues that we are having in the classroom. So. Just this, I want to get a, take a poll, um, if I may. As far as I have a poll question, and it you should see it pop up. Uh, and the question is, on a scale of one to five, with the lowest to the highest, how much do you think challenging behaviors contribute to staff turnover? On a scale of one to five, how much do you think um, Challenging behaviors contribute to staff turnover. I'll give you just a minute to answer those, that question. And I'm seeing some responses. Uh, when you look at exit surveys, if you do any type of survey when, when staff are leaving you, um, we generally have it mentioned. So I can see that many of you are saying at least um, on a level of three, um, several are saying four, and then we have several fives. And that is what we're experiencing industry-wide. So you, if you're feeling alone, you are definitely not alone in this process. Uh, and please understand that I, many of us are feeling some of the same things. And so, um, I'll give you just a minute more if you're answering, but I, I, I want to move us to uh, another question. And, and, and here's that question. I want to know what your personal belief 
uh, is concerning uh, discipline. I want to know what your personal belief. You can put it in the chat if you if you uh, would share that with me. I want to know what your personal belief is concerning discipline on how children, not in the center, but at home, how should children be guided? What's your personal belief? If you want to share a quick note in the chat, you can do that. I can sit and read your responses. And I'll tell you why I want you to think about it. Just tell me what that is. I'll give you just a minute. How about 60 seconds? Personal belief. A quick note on what you believe. How should children be disciplined or guided at home? I see some responses coming in. I have to put on my glasses to read them. Children, children want to be seen and heard as much as we do. Love that response. Talk through the behavior with them, acknowledging feelings. Redirection is important. Should be viewed as an opportunity to learn something. Giving them expectations from the start giving choices on how to achieve. I'm loving these answers. First, start with understanding the why they're upset. Nice. Redirect the behavior by talking about feelings. It should be in place to learn, redirect, not punish. Nice. And so as you think about what your beliefs are, and I can see the, the responses continue to roll in, I also want you to think about your teachers and what they believe, because this is a really valid question to ask your teachers. But then next, I want you to reflect on how does your personal belief coincide or conflict with the guidance practices promoted by your facility? So first I ask, what's your personal belief? Now I'm asking you to think about, is it congruent or does it conflict with the, what your facility promotes? And here's a part of our struggle. Sometimes we have personal beliefs that are different from the philosophy of the program. And, and so when we're working with our teachers, we, we really want to all be on the same page as to what the belief is as far as our program is concerned, what we're promoting and, and how we guide. And those are some really good conversations that I want you to have with your teachers because it's something that they need to really look at and face um, on how differently they may feel about the uh, how children should be guided and what they're that what they're supposed to be implementing in the program. Ah, I see there's some alignment. Nice. So guys, take these two questions back to your staff members uh, and have a staff meeting to to have some conversation about how they feel and what we are promoting, you are promoting as a program to make sure that I can't promote what I don't believe in. And there lies part of the problem as far as the way that we approach guidance in our centers. So just a little activity. So when we start to look at positive guidance and, and um, based on the responses in the chat, uh, the philosophy of most of you is that you believe in positive guidance. And uh, what I want us to look at being able to check our own emotions and calmly take on a role of encouraging and training a child to build the social skills and self-control necessary for future challenges. And so one of the key factors in that statement is to check our own emotions. Um, and we're going to later talk a little bit about co-regulation. And so that because that is an important component when we're looking at the positive guidance. And the second part is for us to um, understand that guidance is a framework because here's our goal. Our goal is to uh, help children understand acceptable 
social practices and ways to express their feelings. And so many of you have mentioned, you mentioned helping children understand their feelings and then to be able to process them. Um, they need guidance in order, to, in order to be safe and feel safe. They need to stay physically and emotionally healthy, develop social, intellectual, and language skills, and finally develop self-concepts and self-control, but they can't develop that by themselves. So I want you to think about something. Uh, before we talk about the strategies, I want you to think about uh, parts of the brain. There are three main parts of the brain. Uh, and, and, and think of, as I go through these main parts, I want you to get, uh, think about a child and their actions. I am my best. And when I say I'm my best, I'm, in, I'm at my best when I'm in the forebrain stage where I am, I can think and reason, uh, age appropriate reasoning. Um, and I am able to make decisions. This is, this is the teaching mode for young children. This is when I need to be able to teach them strategies. As an adult, I am best when I'm in forebrain, okay? Now, when I move to midbrain, I am emotional. I am, I am thinking with my emotions. And I'm going to describe the child that is in midbrain. The one that comes in for school that usually comes in and they're okay and they go through the routine. But today they come in and they whine just a little bit or stand close to you. Uh, and when you ask them a question, they just shrug their shoulders. And so when I'm in midbrain, I, my emotions need to be regulated before I can be directed. And so what, what I want teachers to understand is in order for you to give me commands, in order for you to get me to do what you need me to do, I need to be the, my best me. So my forebrain is my best me. My midbrain, I need my, my emotions need to be taken care of. I need some extra TLC. Now, in hindbrain, that's the third part. So here's where I am in hindbrain. I in hindbrain, I am in survival mode. Okay. I am in that whole fight, flight, or freeze type of situation. So as an adult or a child in hindbrain, I am not my best me. And the only thing I can do, I can't make good decisions. And you often see this. Um, these are now the children that we are seeing who are slinging all the toys off the shelf, who are uh, turning over chairs, who are behaving in that manner. And you're thinking, who is this child? Because I am in a state or place where I am not able to do anything but try to make myself feel safe. So as we go through this presentation, I want you to think of these three parts, not only for children, but for teachers. And so what we need to think about is making sure that our teachers stay in that four brain state, okay? Now, I want you to look at the photograph on the screen. And I want you to think about, uh, when I say, is this your teacher? What do you think I mean? When I, looking at the screen, you see a phone booth, which by the way, when's the last time you came across a phone booth? When I refer to a teacher as a phone booth, what do you think I'm referring to? Tell me in the chat. Okay, somebody that likes to be alone, I'll take it. What else? The teacher, your teacher that is the phone booth closed off from others. Got it. Oh, giving directives from afar. Sure. Isolated. Not helpful unless you, you go up to it. Okay. Some great responses. Who's that teacher that's the phone booth lost? Oh, I like that. The positive. Um, Superman's workroom. Closed off. I've seen that busy. Oh, ah, I have to give the award to Sal. Old school. Yeah. 
When I refer to a teacher that is a phone booth, I'm thinking about the teacher, you guys, that is using practices that are basically antiquated. Yeah. The, the teacher that is attempting to use um, the practices that you, they used many, many years ago. Uh, however, they are not transitioning and using more modern practices or a different approach. So that's the teacher that I think about uh, when I think about the phone booth. Now, all of these other things that you have named are great as well. So I want to think about, I want you to think about five strategies to support teachers with challenging behaviors. And so we, we're going to go over these five strategies because I think that they will make a difference in your approach. And so let's look at the first strategy. Here's what that first strategy is. I want you to make sure that you focus on implementing developmentally and culturally appropriate practices. And so what does that look like in the classroom? Um, anytime you have challenging behavior, behaviors um, in a classroom, the first thing I want you to look at is your classroom. Uh, are we offering developmentally appropriate activities that stimulate children? Are the activities too easy? Are they too hard? If things are too easy, children get bored. If things are too hard, children get frustrated. I want you to look at the environment and determine, are materials accessible rather than available? And those are two different things as far as developmentally appropriate practices, okay? I want you to also think about, when we think about developmentally appropriate practices, are we managing our schedule? Uh, is, are we using appropriate classroom management techniques? Is there too much wait time? All of these things need to be analyzed because what we know is if we look at us as far as our practices are concerned, that 85% um, of behavior can be supported or behavior issues can be supported by environmental changes, okay? So that's our first strategy, looking at developmentally appropriate practices and, and are, they, are they in use? Our second strategy is going to be uh, us focusing on social emotional development. And so if our video plays, if we get this video to play, I, wanna, I want you to watch a, a quick video and then I'm gonna talk about some uh, social emotional aspects of the classroom. Apologies, Sheila, that we aren't able to launch the video. We're not. You know what? I'll tell you what we can do. We can put the video link in the chat box so that people have it. Fabulous. And um, so uh, if you get the opportunity, guys, go and watch this video. There it is. It just popped up in the, in the chat box. If you get the opportunity after this webinar, please watch this video because it really talks about um, the learning brain and where children are their best and, and, and the social emotional focus should be a real push because what you're going to look for is are teachers implementing uh, activities that help children understand their emotions, being able to identify when they are happy, when they are sad and how their bodies feel. Because think about as an adult, I know when I get mad, my body gets warm and and think about being two and a half and three years old and when and being upset and feeling those physical changes in the body and not knowing what was happening so a part of the social emotional is for us to have interactive materials where children can express themselves i cannot practice a skill that i don't have and so it is up to the adults around me to to help me to give me strategies to be able to practice the skills that help me to regulate i also want us to think about the how to create um, emotional deposits for children and i am if you get the opportunity i'd like you to do a little research on the emotional uh, the emotional bank of, of people in the emotional bank of children and what it means to give emotional deposits and what it does to somebody 
for to take to for, for our emotional withdrawals. And so we should be figuring out in in a day how to give more deposits than than withdrawals. And and in fact, here's what research really wants us to be able to do with emotional deposits. It wants us to give a five to one ratio, five deposits for every withdrawal that we take away. And so thinking about that, um, how can our teachers uh, encourage our teachers to give those emotional deposits to children. And those deposits are uh, giving them you know, affirmations, um, be able to, to give them that positive guidance, the, the uh, recommendations as far as things that they can do. Having just conversation, uh, we give directives all day. Hang up your book bag, sit at the table. It's time for lunch, let's wash our hands. That only that type of dialogue with children only gets them from one place to another. It doesn't give me any emotional deposits. How about talk about things that I like, uh, things I want to do. What did I do for and during um, center time? Those types of conversations are enriching conversations that engage children. And then I want us to promote co-regulation. And so when you look at the next slide, as far as co-regulation is concerned, we talk a lot about self-regulation, but self-regulation is an, an unfair thing to ask children to be able to do alone. We need to be able to co-regulate. And here's what that truly involves. In order for me to be able to support students as an adult, um, before I help you regulate as a child, I need to regulate myself. I need to be in, I need to be in that four brain state, that state of mind where I'm able to make those real decisions. I'm able to rationalize. I'm able to um, think through things clearly. And so when I approach children, if I am, am regulated, then I can better regulate them. I can't do breathing exercises with children when I'm not calm myself. And so we want them to be productive learners. Uh, we want them, we, in order for them to be productive learners, we have to strive for, um, for to co-regulate rather than control. So that's our second strategy is for um, us to, um, to work on social emotional development. Here's our third. You need, as a, as a company, as a program, you need to build a behavior protocol process. And you think, what does that look like? Because many, many, often our state requires that we have a guidance policy. But when we write our guidance policy, we write our guidance policy based on what we believe. It's, it's based on your philosophy. A specific behavior protocol is where do I start as far as uh, what happens when I have a behavior uh, issue in a classroom that goes above and beyond to the point that it is disrupting programming on a regular basis. Uh, I want to be able to coach my teachers to recognize and dis discuss uh, consistent behavior issues early. What does that look like? When I start to see a change in behavior that uh, negatively impacts a, a child's ability to actively participate or negatively impacts the operation of the classroom, I need to start looking around and looking at changes. I need to start saying, okay, what is different? Um, if it's a new child to the program, then I need to be able to say, okay, how do I connect with that child? If it's a child that's been in our program uh, for a, a period of time and this is a change in behavior, I need to start connecting to say, all right, what has changed in this child's life? What has changed in my classroom? Um, in order to be able to, to, um, to track that type of information, I need to look at the ABCs of uh, as far as documentation is concerned. I need to have my teacher document. Um, but remind teachers, this is, you're not documenting so that, that you can terminate services for a child. What you're doing, trying to do is document so that you can see patterns. You wanna look at um, what happened before the behavior occurred, what, ha what the behavior was, and then what are the consequences? What was the child's intention? What did they want to get and what actually happened? Um, you want to look at the environment 
the interaction, and then the child, okay? And then finally, and this is something that should be done early, guys, I, and I'm going to say this repeatedly, we have to communicate with families to get them involved early. And that communication, uh, I am not a believer of a, that there's a such thing as a good day or a bad day in early care for a child. And so the parent says, how was his day? Oh, he had a good day. Or, oh, he struggled. I need for parents to receive specific information. You know what? He rocked at uh, small group time, being able to um, with, with follow through, with following directions, with this, that. Um, he struggled at this part of the day. And that's the kind of conversation uh, we need to start with parents so that there's no such thing as a good day or a bad day. So that early communication is something that's key. And sometimes you can find that information that is that is vital. And when you find that information out, what happens is, oh, you know, what if the parent says, you know what, we had a pet that died or grandma just moved out. Um, empathy for children is felt by them. And so, and just like negative energy is as well. So early communications with, with families so that families can not be blindsided by classroom issues. So building that behavior protocol process helps your teachers understand, guess what? They hear us. There is a process in place to support us because guys, when teachers are in the middle of what's going on, they feel overwhelmed. And what they will tend to do is go back to a compliance type of directive type of setting rather than using their skills that or strategies that they have worked on. And, and so in thinking about that, I want you to, again, think about those three parts of the brain. If my teacher is, is, mid, is in the midbrain, uh, then my teacher is thinking with um, their emotions rather than using effectively using those strategies that we know work. The partnership. Here's our next one. The partnership with families is huge. Getting families here, I've repeated this because of the importance. Getting families involved early is vital to the support of the program. It's all about relationships. One of the things that parents need to feel is connected. And so when I talk about getting parents involved early, I need there to be a large amount of parent involvement in the first place, simply because here's what we know. In primary and secondary, uh, parents, the more parents are involved, the better the grades the better the attendance, the better the behavior in primary and secondary. In early care, the more parent involvement, the more parents are understanding of what the center does and the less they, the less they complain. And so what you have to look at is uh, parents need to not only hear from you when something's wrong, they need to hear and connect when something is right. Uh, and that is, it's, it's vital to the relationship because when the relationship is severed, you, they, you struggle with, uh, especially when there's a behavior issue. So encourage that classroom participation. And then let's figure out how to do this. We need to figure out how to connect home and school practices. Um, giving you just an idea of, if we are going to practice breathing exercises at school, then give the suggestion that we practice those at home. If we're gonna read books about sharing and taking turns, then send home a book list that the parents can also read. Uh, if we're gonna develop a social story at school or uh, develop a picture schedule that is individualized at school, then let's have the parents mirror that at home so that the consistency uh, is there. And children are able to see, I see this at home, I see this at school. Most parents will buy in if they know and if they know early. Again, it's early detection of issues. Because here's what we don't want to happen. We don't want inappropriate behavior to become the norm 
rather than the exception. Because if it continues to the point it becomes the norm, then this becomes what I do at this place in time. And this is what is expected by everybody. The teacher expects the behavior. The child says they expect me to do this. And, and so the child complies. So partnering with families is huge. Um, just put in the chat box some ways that you partner with families. Put in the chat box. Give me an idea. Some ways that you partner with families. I'll give you 60 seconds to do that. How do you partner with families? How do you connect them? How do you help, help them understand the importance of birth to five or birth to 12 in an early care setting? And if you are after school, uh, invite them to the classroom to volunteer, love that one. Parent and teacher meetings, of course, excellent. Daily check-ins, an interactive process is, is key to success. Nice. Open communication, check-ins during in and out. Conferences, allowing them to come in and get involved with the curriculum. Excellent. Showing them, I like that, showing them the way we work. That's huge. Nice. So I see that you guys have um, methods to communicate. That daily, weekly communication is vital. Because let me tell you what I hear a lot in, in parent conferences. Whether it's true or not, it's consistent. When we get to a parent conference and we're talking about behavior concerns, Parents say things to me like, I didn't know they would just mention things to me in passing. I had no idea we were at the point of having a formal conference. I want, I don't want parents to be surprised. Often teachers are, we are in the business of customer service. This is what we're, this is what we do. Uh, but we also have to have the ability to be able to have those candid, respectful conversations with families. I think that is one of the things that our teachers struggle with doing. And so as an administrator, making sure you follow up with teachers to talk about what's our approach here, because this is a collaboration. Nice. So as we look at our, our next strategy, is implementing training, technical assistance, and coaching for teachers. So let's just talk about this. Let's just talk about the whole training process. Uh, oftentimes, the solution is for us to get our teachers in a training class. Let's get them in a training class. Oh, let's set up training for them. We're having trouble with this. Ah, oh, let's train. Let's train. Let's train. So what we know is training alone is not going to do it. It's not going to give the teachers the support that is needed um, as far as making changes because less than 30% of what I take from a training class, I'm actually going to implement, okay? So what we need to look at is what type of technical support can we give? Um, can we call in agencies to, to support our teachers in um, implementing developmentally appropriate practices? Um, can we set up coaching sessions? I'll tell you one of the things that we started, and um, the I, I'm not really sure who enjoys it the most, uh, the teachers or myself. We started something called RAP sessions, and RAP stands for Reasonable Appropriate Practices, okay? And so what teachers are able to do is come to do a Zoom chat with me and for us to talk about What's happening in the classroom? What are you experiencing? Teachers need a voice. They need to tell somebody. They need to say, let me tell you what is happening. Because oftentimes what I see is that they haven't articulated um, in their documentation the true picture of what's happening in the classroom. And so teachers need the opportunity to speak with someone and, and dialogue. And what we end up talking about in our RAP sessions we end up dissecting 
the, the classroom and our management and, and talking about strategies to implement going forward. Uh, and I can tell you, it is extremely enjoyable for me uh, to hear teachers talk about their practices proudly and then be willing to try something new. And so that's a part of the whole training, the technical assistance and the coaching part. And then come back to uh, teachers wanting to come back to a rap session to talk about, let me tell you, I tried this over and over again and here's what I got. And so we are able to brainstorm as professionals. I don't, I don't come to the table as the expert. I come to the table as as someone that's going to, to, to brainstorm with them because, again, I can't say this enough, I think teachers need a voice. So this final component of don't just train, then let's get in the classroom, let's see what's happening, let's, let's connect these teachers, especially a teacher that's having trouble with a challenging behavior, let's connect them to someone that can brainstorm with them uh, strategies that they can try. And so those are um, the five suggested strategies just to start, guys, that I have for you as far as how we tackle this, because we've got to come up with a solution. So we're at the point now that we have questions. And so I'll give you a minute if you've got some questions that you want to ask. Sheila, that was such great information. Reminder to put your questions either in the chat or the Q&A, and we will let our expert here tackle it. Um, I would love to hear more about what you guys are experiencing. Now, I know that Sheila, how many teachers do you support, Sheila? Oh, um, from a, about 150 sites. Yeah, so, yeah. The site yeah. I, again, it's it's hard to do math. But anyway, um, <clears throat> here's some great questions. I'll let you just jump right in and tackle the ones you want. And so, um, how do you support teachers in a larger setting, like a hundred plus schools? Uh, that is an overwhelming number. And yes, I do get that. And 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 here's where you start with that uh, partnerships. One of the things, and if, and if you're in different states, what I want you to think about is I need you to tap into your state resources that are out there. Um, it, it, there's no one answer to that. And so we look at, I'm involved with a collaborative now that is going in and supporting classrooms with the pyramid model which uh, basically, you know, you start with those classroom practices and you go up. Um, so that's what we're doing in one state. We've got other agencies that are coming in in, in, in other classrooms. Um, I do a lot of Zoom meetings uh, with, with, with teachers. We also, um, that's why we pull the parents in early because you can't do it by yourself. What, what what has to happen is we have to get everybody to evaluate, you know, what's happening here with the child. And, and parent input is huge because uh, there may be some services that the parents are willing to support if they want them to continue in group care, because that's vital. Uh, it's an interactive process. I'm reading the next one. It says, do you ever find that teachers just come to the RAP session to vent? And how do you keep it more productive? You know what? Um, I I am okay with the teacher just venting because one of the things I know that needs to happen is I know that they need to tell somebody. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like the kid who's just wanting, they just want to tell them. And how do I keep it productive? What I start thinking, I start getting them to think about is let's talk about the things that you have control over. That's what you can change. I need for teachers to change their approach because what they want to do is control the child. I need to get the teacher to control themselves. And when we start talking about controlling self, then it then then I think it changes the lens of of the teacher. And so that's how I keep it productive. But I'm going to acknowledge every single time that the teacher is on is is on the ground fighting. And when and when I do that, 
the venting session is over. Let's see, how do we outline what, oh, <laughs> reasonable accommodations uh, for our program? Uh, that, that is a great question. Um, you know what, when you start to look at what's reasonable, it's you have to look at the, uh, the actual classroom, okay? You've got to look at uh, the, the, the size of the classroom. You have to look at the, the setup as far as things, something it's as simple as where the bathroom is. Is it in the hallway or is it inside the classroom? You have to look at the current dynamics of the classroom. Uh, and, and so when you start looking at that, then it's based on that individual classroom when it becomes reasonable. There is no blanket answer for what is reasonable. Uh, it, what, what you have to be able to show is an interactive process that helps you to determine if you considered what is being asked as far as the request is concerned. I look at it uh, in a couple of different ways. One is um, the my rights end where somebody else's begin and I have to look at not only the individual child, but the scope of the entire classroom to make that determination and stay consistent with the interactive process of going back and forth with the parents for support. All right, so I'm looking at how do you coach teachers to be more positive during the day? You know, wow, yes. Well, I we try to figure out how to get them out of midbrain because you know when your teacher comes in and they are thinking with their emotions rather than their, their forebrain, that being able to be reasonable and, and reason with you. And so um, we all need a little TLC every once in a while. We just got to figure out how to get that teacher what they need in order for them to be more successful. Sometimes it is just a, a pop-in. Uh, sometimes it is just allowing them to take five minutes of your time just to have a conversation. So I, I, I think that that is on, on an individual basis as well. But I need the energy that I give is generally the energy that I get back. And so even if I don't get, even if I get negative energy back, if I keep my energy up, it, it, it becomes infectious. So um, that's, that's what I think about as far as keeping teachers, as far as them being more positive throughout the day. Oh, <laughs> that, um, how do you coach a teacher who has views that do not match the organization? Mm. It depends on how conflicting those views are. See, because when we hire people, what we are, what they are agreeing to do is to promote the philosophy of our program. And see, I don't know that we ask that. Hey, are you willing? This is what we believe here. Are you willing to believe that? Because if you're not, then we can't be together. Because we believe in, if our philosophies are different, then there is going to be that struggle. And what you end up doing, if a teacher's philosophy is so different from yours, the philosophy of your program, you end up losing one way or the other. So you have to decide how different those views are if it is a situation where the teacher just doesn't have the knowledge and you can help that teacher be a believer because what we have to be able to do is is give people strategies i can't take an inappropriate behavior from you without giving you something to replace it and that's just reality so i can't look at a teacher and say you know what you can't do that you can't use timeout you can't do that well then what can i do so um so then i have to uh, figure out if a teacher is coachable or not. If they are coachable, then we're going to rock and roll. If they're not coachable, then I'm setting myself up to fail. So um, while we're waiting for another question, I have so many. So it's okay for me to jump in? For jump in. 
Okay, so um, I have a big question and probably an extreme question, which is when do you get to the point where the behavior is so severe that you consider disenrolling? And if you are at that point, how do you navigate that? How do you do it? How do you work with, um, how is that communicated to the parents? How does, um, how does that happen? So um, the, the point of disenrolling a child in general uh, would be a safety concern. When, when they are jeopardizing the safety um, of, the, of self or others, um, that becomes a, a point where it's just not working. And um, if I can't keep you safe, I can't keep you. Uh, how do you get to that point? There should be a, there should be conversations. That's why that early conversation is so important. And so we're walking through Parents should be able to see what has changes. They should be told in the beginning, hey, let me tell you what we're looking at. We're looking at our practices. We're looking at how we can better meet, meet the needs of your child. Here's, here's a caveat. Without fundamentally changing the whole operation of our program, because we can't do that. I, it, it is unfair for me to change the operation of my program based on one child's needs. And so um, what, what I that conversation should lead there um, and it should not be a surprise. Here's what I generally find. I generally find that parents will say, this is not working for my child. Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that's tough because what, what parents feel like is they feel like they have to be in an early care setting. But if, it, if they're not ready, because everybody's not ready for, for group care, if they're not ready, how much harm are we doing? And so then that's the other part that we have to look at as an organization. You have to look at, um, you know, that it, it's not healthy because behavior is communication. Children just don't wake up deciding that they're going to come in and just um, behave inappropriately for the for the most part of their day. They're, they are struggling to regulate their emotions um, in this environment that go and it and it's going above and above and beyond what is typical for that age. So um, safety and um, the and harm. Yeah, really interesting answer because it's such a caring community that everybody wants to be able to serve everyone and certainly every child. But interesting comment that. A group setting isn't the right place for every child. So interesting. I know that that's something that really tugs on business owners' hearts when they're at the point where they feel like they can't serve someone. So that's a that's a tough one. Um, Anne has a question before I jump back in again about how can you tell in an interview whether or not someone is coachable? Can, are there questions you can ask? What do you, what do you do? Wow, how can you tell in an interview if somebody is not coachable? Start asking them about their previous experiences with supervisors. Uh, and, and one of the things I think that you hear in um, about previous supervisors, uh, they'll start talking about uh, the their why they didn't get along. That that's a red flag for me. Um, for them to mention, well, multiple issues as far as with previous supervisors. Um, the, it's a really hard one because because some people interview so well and you guys know it. You interview somebody and they are a rock star in the interview and the first 90 days you're looking around going, where is that person? <laughs> so we've all been there. Um, and, but I, I truly think that you should get people to talk about uh, the philosophy of your program. And that should be something that you give them before they come and, and, and ask them to, to, to explain it. You know, tell, ask them to tell you what your philosophy looks like in real time and see how they respond. Love that. I also loved your questions about what their philosophy is on discipline. That would be a good interview question. 
Um, also, Ashley mentions how they best receive feedback is a great question. Excellent question. Yeah. yeah really good. Um, my other question was if some of our guests, because everyone can't have a Sheila, you know, we can't all have a Sheila to call and vent to and, you know, whose only job is to support teachers. And yeah. I'm not saying that because it's easy, but everyone can't do that. What, what are your uh, best go-to outside resources that people can draw on if they need a, is there a group that they call on? Is there a, a program or what, do, what would you suggest to people? Where would they go? I'm going to always start with the resource and referral in your, in your area. And that's, that's your starting point. Now, what you're starting to see is more organizations that are um, supporting uh, uh, challenging behaviors that are popping up, springing from resources, and, resource and referral. So that's that's your start. Uh, the I can tell you that a lot. Oftentimes, people say, "Oh, we'll just talk to the pediatrician." And here's what the pediatrician is looking at: the pediatrician is looking at the health of the child. You know, are they are, where they are in the growth chart? Um, that type of thing. Um, oh, it's just, you know, a typical two-year-old. They're not looking at the interaction in group care and how they're responding to it. So resource and referral uh, is a good way to, to, to start. Um, I am a supporter of the pyramid model as far as uh, how it helps teachers understand they have to look at self and environment first and how they are managing because we are all, we are all managed by our environment. So uh, that, that's a that's a other places to start, uh, and then I think that you can get uh, information to grow from there. So, um, because I'm sure everyone else knows the answer to this question, and I don't. Pyramid model, something they can Google. It's yeah, it, it is, <laughs> and they and it uh, and it focuses on, focuses on behavior. And I should have been more prepared to give like a a, a link to it. Um, but uh, you can just Google pyramid model and it'll come up uh, challenging behaviors and, and you'll see the, um, the support that is given. They have a whole website um, of, of, of information that gives activities for teachers and that type of thing so that you can get support. Beautiful. Okay. Thank you. Um, I um, am going to jump over to thank you to everyone who participated with information and um, with questions. Sheila, we love to ask this question of everyone who's gracious enough to give us their time and brain space. Um, we're now in the second half of 2024. I just figured that out yesterday. I'm not sure what happened, but we, we've been in it for a bit. But where do you see our industry's greatest risk at this point? What do you think we're facing that maybe keeps you up at night a little bit? Well, I can tell you that I, I do lose sleep over challenging behaviors. Uh, and I see the struggle losing, losing staff um, to other professions based on the challenging behaviors, uh, based on uh, lower wages, and the lack of support in the way that the teachers feel like they need it. So, yeah, really. so, yeah we, um, we did a recent survey of business owners that said that wages have increased anywhere from 30 to 50 percent since COVID. And still, it's really difficult to pay people enough for them not to go to a non-service based what a uh, position that might be a little less stressful. So the inf the issues we're talking about today are um, are so critical. And and then because we can't talk about the biggest risks without the best opportunities. So uh, what, how do you feel about that? Where do you think our best opportunities are? We are. This is a perfect time for us to make some pivotal changes and think of some out of box, out of the box type of uh, services that we can provide. And and because we are, um, we focus mostly on traditional early care and the practices. And so we need to start thinking more of, of how we can 
offers services because this is a service industry, but um, in 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 ways that will change for children because children are so different now. Um, and and meet the needs of of our businesses, our staff, and our families, and and so that's it's it's going to have to happen. Yeah, I love that so much because anytime you identify a risk, if you solve that really well, it's your greatest opportunity, right? So if this mm-hmm. is everyone's greatest risk, then how? much better will will your business be how much more competitive how much more can you offer children and families if you're the one who really puts the energy and resources into solving this for your your own school so love that love that and you uh you guys coming up next uh, month is the power in processes with uh, another fave speaker, Beth Cannon, so don't miss that. Um, I mentioned our um, survey. Please take the time to do that. We work really hard to gear these um, chats to things that are useful to you guys. Thank you to Marissa for managing us on the um, platform and just great, um, great thanks to you, Sheila. Someone's asking how they can get invites just go to hingeadvisors.com, sign up for all of the opportunities that we offer, and uh, you'll get emails when they're coming up. So love to see you again, Kathleen. But Sheila, thank you so much. I feel like you're in a unique position in the industry to help us all navigate what has increasingly become a, a big, big issue and really make a difference in the lives of uh, children, teachers, and families in our school. So thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Always good to see my hinge people. (laughs) All the time, all the time. Thank you. We'll see you soon, and thank you, friends. All righty. Take care.